Griffin, it's time to play. I'm ready. Hello folks and goats, my name is Griffin, welcome to the Command Valley, I'm joined here today with Landon. Hey guys, Landon here. And we're super excited to present to you guys the first episode of Duel of the Peaks Season 2. Before we begin, I just wanted to remind you all that this episode and this podcast is brought to you by GameGrid. If you are looking for any cards from Caltime or the pre-cons that came out with Caltime, then feel free to head on over to GameGrid's website, which we will link in the description box below, where you can get those cards shipped directly to your house and also support us at the same time. If you are looking for the best way to support us, then head on over to patreon.com slash command valley. Consider joining up with one of our tiers and get access to tons of exclusive content, awesome benefits, and playing commander with the podcast members themselves if you guys don't know what duel of the peak season two is i'll go ahead and introduce it this season includes cards only from 2021 meaning over the course of this year we'll be adding more and more cards to our collection starting with cal time so this first gameplay is going to be using cards from only cal time with each one of the members of the podcast choosing a commander from cal time only cards featured in a draftable booster box will be eligible to be played in our decks for this season. So that means Time Spiral Remastered, Modern Horizons 2, any standard booster box, or any other products like a Battle Bond that may come out this year. Things that are not included are Commander decks, Secret Layers, and any other ancillary product uh, that will come out during the year. And the last thing is we did get rid of the point challenges, so we're just going to go on a win-by-win -win basis. So the winner of the end of the season will be the person with the most wins. And then by the end of the year, we'll have very unique commander decks from the cards from 2021. Thank you for that video introduction, Griffin. Appreciate it. Now let's get into the deck introductions and the opening hands for this game. We're going to be doing something a little bit different than we've done in videos in the past. Each person playing in the game is actually going to be introducing their proper deck. So I will start off introducing mine. The the commander that I've picked for today is Fiora, Judge of Valor. Fiora cares about us casting two spells in a turn, so my deck has three strategies, casting two spells in a turn. There is a slight lifelink theme, and there are as many angels in this deck as I could find. So my opening hand was a Blood on the Snow, a Teregrid's Shadow, Halvar, God of Battle, a Shimmerdrift Veil, a Snow-Covered Plains, and two Swamps. All right, Griffin, can you tell us what deck you're playing today? Yes, sir. Today I will be playing Vega the Watcher, the flying 2-2 bird that carries when you cast spells from outside of your hand. So obviously with Cal Time, it cares about the 4-tell mechanic. So the first strategy in this deck is packing all the 4-tell cards so that I can draw cards when I cast them from the 4-tell zone. There's also a sub-theme of gaining life. And of course, like Lannan's deck, I've packed a lot of angels and angel synergies in this deck as well. My opening hand was a Glorious Protector a Sirtland Elementalist, a Gold Maw Champion, Nico Eris, two planes, and an island. Pass off to Peter to introduce his deck. Peter here, and I am playing Jorn, God of Winter. My goal with this deck is to play a lot of snow things to untap, get some insane value on the board with the extra mana that I have, and overwhelm my opponents with some zombie tribal mixed in there. My opening hand consists of Glittering Frost, Rise of the Dread Mare, Binding the Old Gods, Glimpse the Cosmos, Rhymewood Falls, Dark Boar Pathway, and a Snow-Covered Island. Hey guys, this is Caleb, and today I am playing Asika, God of the Tree. This deck is aiming to get access to all five colors of mana as quickly as possible, then ramp with legendary creatures using Asika's ability, and then play the most powerful cards from Call Time to outvalue the rest of the guys. My opening hand for this game consists of Path to the World Tree, Doomscar, Burning Rune Demon, Snow Covered Forest, Dark Boar Pathway, Sulphurous Mire, and Snowfield Sinkhole. With the deck introductions and opening hands out of the way, let's begin the game with Peter. Good luck, everybody, and let's begin. Peter starts the game by drawing and playing down a Rhymewood Falls tapped as his land for turn and passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin draws and plays on an island and passes to Caleb. Caleb draws and plays down a Snowfield Sinkhole tapped and then passes to Landon. Landon draws and plays down a Shimmerdrift Veil naming White as it enters the battlefield and then passes the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays on a snow-covered island and then taps two mana to foretell a card. He then passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin draws, plays down a plains, and will tap two mana as well to foretell a card and then ships the turn to Caleb. 
Caleb untaps and draws and plays down a Slitherbore pathway, and liking what everybody else is doing, taps his lands to also foretell a card. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Landon. Landon begins his turn by untapping and drawing and plays down a Swamp, and also taps two mana to foretell a card, passing the turn to Peter. You'd think that uh, the Vega deck would be the one foretelling a card, but apparently since we're all playing cards from Kaltheim, everybody wants to foretell on turn two. A lot of profits uh, for foretelling the future. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know what you guys think they're foretelling. <laughs> Peter untaps and draws and plays on a Dark Boar Pathway and determines to break the cycle of foretelling, pays three mana to cast his commander, Jorn, God of Winter. Feeling satisfied, he passes the turn to Griffin. He's been Jorn, huh? Yeah, he has been Jorn. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down a Plains and then taps all of his mana to cast his commander, Vega the Watcher. He then ends his turn. Vega. I just want to mention that um, Peter has been doing everything I want to do, but first, uh, so that was pretty irritating, but at least I've got my commander out. Something like turn order or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> Caleb untaps and draws and plays on a snow-covered forest as his land for turn, and instead of casting his commander, he pays two mana for a path to the world tree. When it ETBs, he searches his library for an island and puts it into his hand and then shuffles his library and then ends his turn. Landon begins by untapping and drawing and plays down a snow-covered island as his land for turn. He then pays two mana to cast Sword of the Realms, which is the flip side of Halvar, God of Battle. He then passes the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and taps three mana to cast a Glittering Frost, enchanting his Dark Boar Pathway to make it a snow land that taps for an additional mana of any color. He then heads the combat, swinging Jorn at Caleb for a total of 3 damage, and on attack, Jorn tr will trigger, untapping all of Peter's permanents because there are all snow permanents at this point. Caleb has no blocks and has to take 3 damage. Peter goes to his second main phase, paying 2 mana to cast a Glimpse the Cosmos. He looks at the top 3 cards of his library and puts 1 into his hand and the rest on the bottom of his library. He finishes his turn by tapping 2 more mana to foretell another card, and passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps, draws, and pays 2 mana to foretell a card. He then heads to combat, swinging Vega in the air at Peter for 2 damage who will take it, and then Griffin passes the turn back to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws and plays on a Glacial Floodplain tapped as his land for turn and taps 2 mana to foretell a card, and with nothing left to do he ships the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and he plays on a Plains as his land for turn and then taps 4 mana to cast his foretold card which is a Terrigrid's Shadow. This is going to force each of his opponents to sacrifice two creatures. Griffin responds to this by casting his own foretold card, which will be Depart the Realm. He targets Vega and puts it back into his hand so he doesn't have to sacrifice it. This will also trigger Vega on the cast, drawing him a card, and then Vega will go back to his hand. Tegrid's Shadow then resolves. Peter is the only one with a creature, so he has to sacrifice Jorn, and he sends it back to the command zone. With nothing left, Landon passes the turn back to Peter. I think I should have waited for that Terrigrid Shadow, but oh well. That's what I was wondering too. I was hoping to get Vega and Jorn, but you bounced Vega back to your hand, so... Ooh, stonks. <laughs> because I was planning on casting my commander the turn after that, and I knew that my deck didn't have a ton of creatures, so I didn't want to like ever get screwed over by my own spell, so I just thought it would be a good time to fire it off. Well thought, Landon. Yeah. Well played. Peter starts turn 5, untapping and drawing, and taps 4 mana to cast Binding the Old Gods, choosing to destroy Landon's Sword of the Realms in retaliation for making him sacrifice Jorn. He'll then play a Shimmer Drift Veil as his land for turn, choosing black, and then he passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down a Plains as his land for turn, and then pays 2 more mana to foretell yet another card. He will then pay 2 more mana to cast a Carfell Harbinger, a mana dork for instants and sorceries and foretelling cards. And then Griffin passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws and plays on a snow-covered island for turn and taps 3 mana to cast a Replicating Ring, the honorary soul ring in this meta. <laughs> uh, we, were, we were very excited for this card because if there's any game that you're going to be able to get all the counters on Replicating Ring, then this is going to be it. Seriously though. <laughs> With nothing left, Caleb passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays on a snow-covered plains and then taps out to cast his commander, Fyoda, Judge of Valor. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws, and his Saga Binding of the Old Gods will trigger after his draw step, and he tutors up a Woodland Chasm onto the battlefield tapped. He then pays two more mana to foretell a card, and then ships the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws, and pays three mana to cast Vega from his hand, and then taps the rest of his mana to foretell a card. In Griffin's end step, Caleb flashes in a Glorious Protector from Exile, which does absolutely nothing when it enters the battlefield since he has no other creatures to target. 
With no further game actions, Caleb begins his turn by untapping and adds a knight counter to the replicating ring in his upkeep. He draws and plays down a sulfurous mire as his land for turn, and that will enter the battlefield tapped. He then pays 6 mana for a burning rune demon. He searches his library for a Varagoth Blood Sky Sire and Valky God of Lies, and chooses Landon to choose one for his hand and the other for the graveyard. Landon lets Valky go to the graveyard, and Caleb puts Varagoth in his hand. Caleb then heads to combat, swinging his glorious protector at Griffin, who will take it. With nothing left to do, Caleb passes the turn back to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays on a Great Hall of Starnheim, tapped, and then pays 2 mana to foretell a card. He then passes, but in his end step, Peter has some actions. He taps 2 mana to cast Behold the Multiverse from foretell, scrying 2 and drawing 2 cards. Then he taps the last of his mana to cast Depart the Realm from foretell, returning Binding the Old Gods to his hand before it can sacrifice itself at the beginning of his turn. Well played, Peter. Well played. I wonder what book you got that from. Yeah, Depart the Realm and foretelling stuff. Find your own deck strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Peter then goes to his turn, untaps and draws, and plays on a snow-covered swamp, and then taps three mana to cast a replicating ring of his own, and then pays the rest of his mana to recast his commander, Jorn. He then ships the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down an island as his land for turn, and then pays four mana for Nico Aris with X equal to one, and so he will make one shard token. And if you're unfamiliar with what shard tokens are, you can pay two mana to sacrifice it, scry one, and then draw a card. So it's like a better version of a clue, pretty much. He will then pay one more mana to cast a foretold raven form to exile Caleb's burning rune demon and have him make a one one bird token in its place. This will trigger his commander, Vega, for casting a spell outside of his hand and then he will draw a card. He then down ticks Nico by one to deal four damage to Caleb's glorious protector since he has drawn two cards this turn and that will send the angel back to the graveyard. With nothing left he passes the turn to Caleb. That's what happens when you swing at me for three it's gonna come back and haunt ye. Yeah thank you for the rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> I, need, I needed that. <laughs> Caleb then untaps and puts a second counter on his replicating ring. He draws and pays seven mana into his Path of the World Tree, sacrificing it to draw two cards, gain two life, and deal two damage to Vega. And Griffin will lose two life, and he will make a 2-2 bear token. I do not remember him doing that at all. I, I don't know where the crap I was. You were well, probably yeah, like sitting stuff. back and sick of the game already. Having taken out his revenge in full, Caleb is very satisfied and passes the turn back to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays down a snow-covered plains and then taps 3 mana to play Starheim Courser. Unfortunately, he's not able to cast a second spell this turn and instead taps 2 mana to foretell a card from his hand and then passes the turn to Peter. Peter begins by untapping and putting a counter on Replicating Ring in his upkeep and then draws a card. He then pays 2 mana for a Sculptor of Winter and then pays 5 mana for a Graven Lore. He used all snow mana for the Graven Lore, so he gets to scry five, keeping two on top and putting three on bottom, and then he draws three cards. At this point, Caleb is trying to convince Peter to play his Binding of the Old Gods again. He knows he has it in his hand, and because Caleb is trying to cast his own enchantment commander at the Prismatic Bridge. Peter then heads into combat, swinging Jorn at Griffin for three damage, and Jorn will trigger on the attack, untapping all of his snow permanents, and Griffin will take the three damage as he has no blockers. In his second main phase, Peter will cast Varagoth Blood Sky Sire for 3 mana and a Pilfering Hawk for 2 mana. He'll then tap 2 more mana to foretell a card and then passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin will untap and draw and pay 3 mana to cast Nico Defies Destiny, whose first chapter lets him gain 4 life for having 2 foretold cards in exile. He then will pay 2 more mana to crack the shard token, scrying and drawing a card, and then will tick Nico up 1 more to make a shard for the one that he just sacrificed. He then pays 2 more mana to foretell a card from his hand and then passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and adds a counter to his replicating ring and then will drop her turn. He plays a snow covered forest for, as his land for turn and then heads into combat swinging the bird that Griffin gave him at Nico for 1 which is enough to take the planeswalker out. Caleb again comments on how Peter has not played his Binding of the Old Gods, desperately pleading with him to play it and target something that is in his commander. Caleb will then tap 4 mana to foretell 2 cards from his hand, and then tap 3 mana to cast his own Varagoth, Blood Sky Sire. He then taps the remainder of his mana to cast a Bind the Monster, enchanting and tapping down Peter's Jorn and dealing 3 damage to Caleb as part of the spell's ability. Hoping that that will be enough to entice Peter to play out his Binding of the Old Gods again, he will then pass the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays on a Swamp as his land for turn, and then taps 2 mana for a Revitalize, gaining him 3 life and drawing a card. He then pays 2 mana for the Aura Rune of Sustenance, enchanting his commander, 
which on cast will trigger his commander Fjorda for having played a second spell in a turn. He gets to look at the top three cards of his library, he puts one into his hand, and the other two will go into the graveyard. He will then draw a card from the rune entering the battlefield. He taps three more mana for a search for glory, tutoring up Terrigrid, God of Fright, and gaining three life. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps everything except for Drawn because of the Bind the Monster, and puts a counter on his Replicating Ring. He draws and plays on a snow-covered island as his land for turn and taps it to activate Pilfering Hawk's ability to draw a card and discard a card. He then goes to combat, swinging Varagoth at Caleb, who has no blockers and will take the damage. He taps 2 mana to activate Varagoth's boast ability, tutoring up a card and putting it on top of his library. He activates Sculptor of Winter's ability to untap his Dark Boar pathway and then pays 6 mana to cast a Blood on the Snow, destroying all creatures and sending Jorn to the graveyard and promptly returning it from Blood on the Snow's second ability, which lets him return a creature according to how much snow mana he paid into the spell. This will get rid of the Bind the Monster that is on Jorn and all the other creatures in play will be destroyed. He will then pay one more mana to cast a Foretold Rise of the Dread Marn, and since 8 non-token creatures died this turn, he's going to make 8 2 2 Zombie Berserker tokens. With nothing left, he will pass the turn to Griffin. This was a very, very important play. Because we're playing Kaltime Limited, only cards from Kaltime, there's not a lot of board wipes in our decks. So the fact that Peter was able to create an army of 2 2 tokens, which normally wouldn't be scary, is actually a very threatening position on this board. Griffin untaps and draws, and Nico Defies Destiny will go to its second lore chapter, giving Griffin 2 mana that he can use on Foretell Spells this turn. He'll then pay 5 mana to recast Vega from the Command Zone, and then spends 2 mana from the Saga to cast a Foretold Augury Raven, which will trigger Vega and will draw him a card. He then will play an Island as his land for turn, and passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and puts a 4th counter on his Replicating Ring, and then draws and plays down a Snow-Covered Island as his land for turn. He pays 5 snow mana to cast his own Graven Lore, scrying 5, putting 2 on the bottom, and then drawing 3 cards that he left on top. Caleb at this moment asks Peter if those zombies are going at him, and Peter responds that it's not his turn, so they are not. They were going at him. Anyways, Caleb then pays 3 mana to cast a Foretold Doomscar, attempting to destroy all creatures. However, Griffin will respond by tapping out to cast a Disdainful Stroke, and since Doomscar technically has a CMC of 5, it is successfully countered and goes to the yard. Disappointed with the outcome of that turn, Caleb passes to Landon. A little bit of insider information into that play. Since I was playing the Vega deck and Landon was playing Fira, the threat was not on us two. So the reason why I countered that spell was because I assumed that Peter was going to put those zombies to my advantage attacking Caleb. Because we can all tell that Caleb's commander is definitely the most threatening, the one that has the highest power on it definitely i strictly the best i think but well besides jorn well yeah both of them had very powerful commanders and so by countering that spell is hoping to clear the path for peter to go ahead and hit those zombies over at caleb knocking his life total down to a point where he has to think about his plays more landon untaps and draws and then pays one mana for an usher of the fallen and then taps four more mana for an eradicator valkyrie he then passes the turn to peter Peter untaps and then adds a counter to his replicating ring, which will be the third one on it, and then he draws and then taps 5 mana to cast Narfi Betrayer King, giving all his snow and zombie creatures a plus 1 plus 1 power buff. He then taps 3 mana to cast a Horizon Seeker, and then goes directly to combat. He swings Jorn at Griffin and his 8 zombies at Caleb. Jorn is going to trigger and untaps all of his snow permanents, leaving only the zombies tapped down. No blocks from either Caleb or or Griffin, so Griffin is going to take 4 and Caleb will take 24 damage. In his second main phase, Peter casts Draugr Helm, paying the extra 3 mana to make a zombie berserker token and attaches the helm to it. Peter then passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws, and sending Nico defies destiny to its third lore chapter, which lets him return Raven form from the graveyard to his hand. He pays 2 more mana to foretell a card and decides to pass the turn. In his end step, Landon casts a foretold poison the cup targeting Vega. Griffin responds by casting a Glorious Protector from Fortel, targeting Vega to exile and lets him draw a card from Vega's trigger. Vega goes into exile and Poison the Cup fizzles so Landon does not get this cry trigger. So I want to ask you, Landon, because I was very curious about this play. Why did you decide to target Vega? I was trying to strip resources out of your hand so when I played my board wipe, like, everything would get wiped. I didn't want you to... Like, I wanted you to either spend a counter spell or some type of, like, protection spell for Vega. Because as much as, like, I was afraid of the zombies, I was afraid of 
like just the pure card draw that you had like and i knew that my deck couldn't really keep up with that because i have to spend two spells to draw a card and you just really have to spend one card to draw a card so your deck is like a perpetual one for one where my deck isn't and i knew that the only person that would counter my blood on the snow would be you and i needed that blood on the snow to resolve because I needed to get something back from my graveyard. I had like a line of play that ends up happening later in the game. So does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. That's 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 really cool to set into your mind a little bit about that. That's that's awesome. Yeah, it was it was just a bait. Um, there weren't any really other good targets. Like I thought about hitting Narfi, but like he could have just brought him back. So I was actually hoping that you would use the Raven form on Narfi to exile it. So poison the cup on Narfi wouldn't really do much. So anyways, that was that was my reasoning. Fascinating. Caleb begins his turn, untaps, and adds a fifth counter to his replicating green, and then draws for turn, and pays four mana for a Halvar God of Battle. He then pays four more mana for an Immersturm Predator, and then passes the turn to Landon. Freaking vampire dragon. Landon untaps and draws and pays two mana for a Clarion Spirit, and then pays five mana for his pet card, Terrigrid God of Fright. Hey, that's a good card. <laughs> it is a good card. <laughs> this will trigger the Clarion Spirit, having seen the second spell cast this turn, and he will make a 1-1 Spirit with flying. He then passes the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps and adds a fourth counter to his replicating ring, and then draws and pays four mana to re-equip the Draugr's Helm to Jorn, giving him a plus two plus two buff and menace. He heads to combat, swinging Jorn at Griffin, and nine zombies at Landon, and Narfi and Horizon Seeker at Caleb. On attack, Jorn will trigger and untap all of Peter's snow permanents, but Caleb will respond to that trigger on the stack, casting Iron Verdict, targeting Narfi with enough damage to take it out. Jorn's trigger then resolves, and his snow permanents untap. Griffin chooses not to block, and Caleb blocks Horizon Seeker with Halvar, and Landon blocks two of the zombies with his Eradicator Valkyrie and Terrigrid. In response to declared blocks, Peter will tap three mana to return Narfi from the graveyard to the battlefield. But Griffin will respond and cast a foretold Mystic Reflection, targeting Narfi, making it enter the battlefield as a copy of one of Peter's zombie tokens instead. Peter will also respond to blocks by activating his Horizon Seeker's Boast ability to search for a snow-covered island and put it into his hand. Finally, no further actions happen and damage will go through, with Peter's Horizon Seeker and two zombies dying from combat damage. Griffin will take 5 and Landon will take 14 damage. Moving to a second main phase, Peter will tap 2 mana to cast a Foretold Jarl of the Forsaken, targeting Caleb's Halvar since it was taken damage this turn. In response, Caleb will sacrifice it to the Immerstrom Predator, tapping it and giving it a plus one plus one counter and exiling Peter's Varagoth from his graveyard. This will trigger Terrigrid seeing a creature being sacrificed and Landon will get control of Halvar. And with nothing left, Peter passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and pays two mana to foretell another card and then heads to combat swinging Augury Raven at Peter for three damage which Peter will take. He then passes the turn to Caleb. At this moment in the game, Peter has definitely become the arch enemy with the insane value that he's gotten from the zombie tokens and Jorn, just all the things that are going on in his battlefield. So I have the ability now to concentrate my firepower even if it's just one bird over at Peter. I wasn't too threatened by Caleb anymore because his life total was getting severely low. And I also had a Raven form in my hand so I wasn't scared of the Immerstorm Predator. How did you feel at this point landing in the game? I was feeling kind of confident. I did have a trick up my sleeve, so I, I did have an answer to what was going on on the board, but I did feel like I didn't have much of a value engine going, and I didn't feel like I was advancing my board state quite as much as I wanted to, but pieces were kind of coming together, and I was getting more confident as the turns went on. Caleb is going to untap and adds a sixth counter to his replicating ring, and then he draws his card for turn. He then plays down a snow-covered mountain, and then taps three snow mana to cast Search for Glory. He's going to tutor up Carter, Doom Scourge, into his hand and gains 3 life from the snow mana. He then pays 4 mana to cast Carter, which will make all of Caleb's opponent's creatures have to attack on the next turn and attack somebody other than him. He will pay 3 more mana to cast Inga Rune Eyes, letting Caleb scry 3 to the bottom when it enters the battlefield. With nothing left, he passes the turn. Yeah, Carter was definitely a, a, a huge game changer. Gears. Yeah, that was... Uh, well done, Caleb. That was a well wonderful tutor. That was a haymaker. Landon untaps and draws and heads straight into combat, being forced to swing because of Carter, and swings everything that he has at Peter. Before Peter declares blockers, holding priority, Landon activates the boast ability of Usher of the Fallen to make a 1-1 human warrior token. 
He then activates the boast ability of Eradicator Valkyrie to sacrifice a creature and to force each opponent to sacrifice a creature. He sacrifices his token he just created, Peter sacrifices a zombie token, Griffin sacrifices his Glorious Protector, which will return Vega to the battlefield, and Caleb will sacrifice Inga, drawing him three cards since three creatures have died this turn. Tergit is going to trigger from the sacrificings, and Landon will gain control of Inga and Glorious Protector, and when Inga enters the battlefield under Landon's control, he's going to scry three, and then he decides not to exile anything with the Protector. With that all finished, Peter chooses to double block Tergrid with two of his untapped creatures. In response to the blocks, Landon taps one mana to cast Village Rites, sacrificing Tergrid to draw two cards. Carter will then trigger, seeing an attacking creature die, and each of Caleb's opponents will lose a life and he will gain a life. Damage then resolves, and Peter will take a total of 13 damage, and in his second main phase, he taps three mana to cast Resplendent Marshal, choosing not to exile anything, but Clarion Spirit does trigger and he will make a 1-1 Spirit with flying. He will then ship the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps and adds a fifth counter to his Replicating Ring and then draws for turn. He taps 5 mana to cast a Carfell Kennel Master, giving Jorn and Jarl of the Forsaken plus 1 plus 0 and Indestructible until the end of the turn. He heads to combat, swinging Jorn and the Jarl at Landon and the 8 zombies at Griffin. Jorn will trigger, untapping all the snow permanents, and Landon will double block Jorn with his Marshal and Spirit. Griffin chooses not to block and all of the damage will resolve. Peter then passes, but on his end step, Griffin casts Graven Lore with only 1 snow mana, so he scries 1 and puts it on the bottom and then draws 3 cards. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down a planes as his land return and taps 3 mana for a Righteous Valkyrie which will gain him life whenever an angel enters a battlefield. He then casts a Stalwart Valkyrie and being an angel will trigger the Righteous Valkyrie giving Griffin 2 life. He heads to combat swinging everything at Peter for a total of 5 damage and with nothing left passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and his Replicating Ring will get its 7th counter and then he draws and pays 2 mana for a Rune of Flight targeting Carter letting him draw a card on ETB. He then taps 3 mana to finally cast his commander, Essica, God of the Tree, and then taps 5 mana to cast Allrund, God of the Cosmos. He heads to combat and swings Carter at Peter for a total of 4, and since it's flying, Peter has to take it. In his second main phase, he pays 2 mana for a Rune of Mortality, attaching it to Allrund and drawing another card. He passes, but in his end step, Allrund is going to trigger and Caleb chooses Creature, which means he reveals the top two cards of his library and can put Horizon Seeker into his hand, and he sends Blessing of Frost to the bottom of his library. Landon then starts his turn, untaps, and draws and plays down a snow-covered swamp, and taps 7 mana to recast Fiora from the command zone. He then pays 2 mana for a Spectral Steel, attaching it to his Eradicator Valkyrie. This triggers Fiora and Clarion Spirit, so he's going to get a card from the top three and the others will go into his graveyard and then he will make a 1-1 Spirit. He heads to combat, swinging 9 damage in the air at Peter, who has to take it going down to 3. After damage is dealt, but before combat ends, Griffin casts Sigrid God Favored, targeting Landon's Glorious Protector, exiling it under Sigrid until she leaves the battlefield. With Landon's combat ending, he passes the turn to Peter. Peter, on his last legs, starts turn number 13. He untaps and puts a 6th counter on Replicating Ring, and then draws and is very excited to see what he just top decked, and casts Coma Cosmos Serpent. He then taps 3 more mana to cast Mask Vandal, exiling a creature from his graveyard to exile Caleb's Rune of Flight on Carter. Deciding that it's not wise to attack here, he passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and Peter makes a Coma's Coil in his upkeep. He draws and heads straight to combat. Peter doesn't have enough things to tap down everything with flying, so Peter lets Griffin go into combat without tapping anything down, and Griffin will swing Augury Raven at Peter for 3 damage, and that will be enough to finish him off. Peter will respond to this by sacrificing his coil to tap down Caleb's Immerstrom Predator, letting him exile Tergrid from Landon's graveyard, and it will get a plus 1 plus 1 counter. He then takes the damage and goes down to 0, and he is out of the game. Rip in peace, Peter. Man, the way that this game was going, I swear that Peter was just going to run away with it. The the course of events that happened after he made the 2-2 two -two zombies and pumped him up with Narfi, I mean, it just seemed like Peter had such a strong hold on the game, but you can see how the leaves can fall so quickly on the trees that bloom in Commander. It's also very interesting to note that in Limited, like a draft setting, flyers are always the best. And it turns out in Limited Commander, flyers are always the best. It seemed like Peter only took damage from Flyer, so even though I only had very few creatures on the battlefield at one time, I did have Flyers, which made a huge impact on Peter's life total. Well done, Peter. Yes, well done, Peter. Going into his second main phase, Griffin plays on an island as his land return and then taps 4 mana for a foretold Shepherd of the Cosmos, but fails to return anything from his graveyard. 
This will still trigger Vega since he casts a spell from outside of his hand and he will draw a card. When the ETBs, it will also trigger Righteous Valkyrie and Griffin will gain 3 life. He then pays 2 mana for a strategic planning to put a card from the top 3 cards of his library into his hand and the rest will go into his graveyard and he will pay 2 mana to foretell a card. In Griffin's end step, Caleb will attempt to cast a Foretold Poison the Cup targeting Landon's commander to destroy it. It resolves and Caleb will scry 2 cards from the top of his library to the bottom. Caleb then starts his turn and untaps and adds his 8th counter to the replicating ring and since it is the 8th counter he removes all 8 knight counters from it and makes 8 replicated rings. Yay, he did it! Yes, he did the mad lad. <laughs> the, he, he finally did it. So I just wanted to add here a real quick comment about the replicating rings. It is very scary to see your opponent just create 8 mana rocks. But it didn't seem very scary at the time because Caleb was really coming down on cards. He didn't have much left in his hand. And he already had enough mana itself without the mana rocks to cast those cards. So without some kind of card draw engine to get him going, these 8 replicating rings wasn't actually that scary. Caleb will then draw her turn and pays 5 mana to cast Battle of Frost and Fire. When it ETBs, it is going to deal 4 damage to each non-giant creature, wiping everyone's board. Caleb will respond to this by sacrificing Carter to Emmerstone Predator, giving it a plus one plus one counter and indestructible until end of turn and it will be tapped. Essica will go back to the command zone, but Allrunt is big enough to survive the onslaught of fire. On Landon's board, Inga Runeyes is going to die and that will trigger and give him three cards. And on Griffin's board, Sigrid dying will bring Glorious Protector back to the battlefield under his control. Caleb then taps his eight replicated rings for Wooburg and adds three more green to cast the Prismatic Bridge for a total of seven mana. He then taps two more mana to cast a Horizon Seeker. He then passes and Allrund will trigger, giving him a Kosama God of the Voyage from the top of his library. Landon untaps and draws and plays on a snow-covered swamp and then taps six mana for a Blood on the Snow, wiping the board once again. Caleb responds by activating Immerstone Predator to sacrifice Allrund and give it Indestructible, and then his Horizon Seeker is destroyed as well. Landon returns an Eradicator Valkyrie from Blood on the Snow's second half and then pays two mana for a Stalwart Valkyrie exiling a card from his graveyard to cast it, and he passes the turn. Griffin starts turn number 14 by untapping and drawing, and plays down a planes as his land for turn, and taps 3 mana for his own Cosima, God of the Voyage. He then pays 6 mana to cast a Foretold All Runs Epiphany, creating 2 1 1 bird tokens, and will take an extra turn after this one. He then pays 1 mana for a Raven form, exiling Caleb's Immerstrom Predator once and for all, giving him a bird for his troubles. He then passes and goes to his second turn, untapping and choosing to exile Kosima in his upkeep. He draws and plays on a planes, which will give Kosima a counter and then heads to combat. He swings the two birds at Caleb, and Caleb will trade his bird for one of Griffin's birds and will take the other one point of damage. Griffin then pays nine mana for a Sirtland Elementalist and then passes the turn. In his end step, Caleb pays four mana to cast Feed the Serpent, exiling the Elementalist before Griffin has a chance to use it. Ooh, that was clutch. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't even have any instants or sorceries in my hand. It was just a big beater. It's a nice, it's huge. Caleb begins his turn by untapping and puts a counter on Replicating Ring since there is one still around and then triggers his Prismatic Bridge, getting a Sculptor of Winter from his library onto the battlefield for free. He draws and triggers Battle of Frost and Fire, scrying the top three cards of his library to the bottom. He then taps 8 of his rings for a green, black, and 6 red and uses 4 of it to cast Binding the Old Gods, which will destroy Landon's Eradicator Valkyrie. Using 3 more floating mana, he casts Arnie Brokenbow, and then uses the last of it and 2 more mana to cast Cosima, God of the Voyage. He heads to combat, and with Arnie having haste, swings it at Landon. Landon chooses not to block, and Caleb will activate Arnie's boast ability, pumping it up to 4, and Landon takes 4 damage, and then Caleb passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays on a planes and then pays 9 mana to cast Fiora for the third time this game and passes with nothing left to do. In his end step, Griffin sacrifices his shard to scry one to the bottom and draw a card. Griffin untaps and draws and he plays down a blood plane as his land for turn which will trigger Cosima to return her to the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it and he will draw a card. He then plays Resplendent Marshal for 3, exiling an Augury Raven from his graveyard to put a plus one plus one counter on his bird token. He then pays 2 to foretell a card and then leaves creatures up to block and passes the turn. 
Caleb untaps and gives a counter to the ring and triggers his prismatic bridge to get a Jarl of the Forsaken from his library onto the battlefield. He draws Battle of Frost and Fire triggers its third chapter, so when he casts CMC's 5 or greater this turn, he's going to get to draw 2 cards and discard a card. Binding of the Old Gods will also trigger its second lore chapter, giving him a Woodland Chasm from his library onto the battlefield tapped. He then plays a Highland Forest as his land for turn and then heads into combat. He'll swing Arnie at Landon again, boasting him like he did the last turn up to 4 power, and Landon takes it going down to 24. With no high CMC spells to play, he passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays on a snow covered swamp as his land for turn and casts a foretold Iron Verdict, taking out Caleb's Arnie and then taps 4 mana for a Jarl of the Forsaken. This will trigger his commander Fjorda, letting him look at the top three cards and put one into his hand and the other two into his graveyard. He then activates the Great Hall of Starnheim, sacrificing it and his Jarl to make a 4-4 angel with vigilance. He moves to combat, swinging everything he can at Caleb for 5 who takes it and then Landon will gain 2 lifelink from his commander and passes the turn back to Griffin. Griffin goes into turn number 16, untaps and draws and pays 2 mana for Glimpse the Cosmos, putting the card from the top 3 into his hand and the rest on the bottom of his library. He pays 4 mana for a Halvar, God of Battle, and pays 1 mana for a Giant's Amulet, not paying the extra cost for the Giant token. He'll instead pay 2 to equip it to the Resplendent Marshal, making it a 3-4 with Double Strike thanks to Halvar. He heads to combat, swinging the Marshal and his 2-2 bird at Caleb for 8 damage, and Caleb having no flyers is unable to block, knocking Caleb out of the game. Rip in peace, Caleb. Caleb was definitely the one starting off this game on top with that prismatic bridge in his command zone that was just unlimited potential where he could just get multiple cards per turn. So you can see that Caleb was definitely a threat from the beginning but managed to crawl his way back up into a very commanding board state multiple times but just couldn't manage to get those flyers out of the air to keep himself alive. Griffin will end his turn by casting a Beskir Shieldmate for 2 mana and then passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays a Snow Covered Plains as his land for turn and then pays 2 mana to activate Spectral Still from his graveyard which will return another aura or artifact from his graveyard to his hand and he chooses to return Rune of Sustenance to his hand. He pays 1 mana for a Code Spell Cleric and being the second spell he's cast he puts a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it and when it enters the battlefield Fyoda will trigger and he gets to look at the top 3 cards of his library he puts 1 into his hand and the other 2 into his graveyard. He then pays 1 mana to enchant Valor of the Worthy onto Fyoda giving it a plus 1 plus 1 counter and then pays 3 mana for a Raider's Carve. He heads to combat which will trigger Griffin's Halvar and Griffin will choose to move the Giant's Amulet to Halvar. Landon will swing 11 in the air at Griffin, and in response to this, Griffin casts a foretold Iron Verdict to take out Landon's 4-4 Angel token. As you can probably all tell, this was a play mistake on our part. Landon's Angel had Vigilance, so I couldn't have been able to target it with the Iron Verdict. Landon did forget that it had Vigilance, so this was a mistake on our part, so forgive us for that. With nothing left to do, Landon passes the turn back to Griffin. Griffin untaps and exiles Cosima in his upkeep, and then he draws and heads into combat swinging everything at Landon for 13. Landon will take 13, Griffin then pays 6 mana for a Valkyrie Harbinger, and then pays 4 mana for Orvar the All Form, and then passes the turn hoping it will be enough to survive his next combat. Landon untaps and draws, and he plays on a Swamp as his land for turn, and then pays 3 mana for a Doomscar Oracle. He then pays 2 mana for Demonic Gifts, giving his Spirit plus 2 plus 0. Fyoda then triggers, getting his card from the top 3 and 2 into his graveyard. Landon will gain 2 more life from the Doomscar Oracle. Landon then casts Varagoth Bloodsky Sire and heads to combat. Halvar will trigger, moving the Giant's Amulet to his Valkyrie Harbinger. Landon pilots his Raider's Carve with Doomscar Oracle and swings everything he can at Griffin. Raider's Carve fails to find anything off the top, and Griffin will block both the Raider's Carve and the Code Spell Cleric, which will both die and Griffin will gain 4 life from the lifelink. He'll take the rest of the damage, going down to 2. Landon passes, and at the end step, Griffin makes an Angel for having gained 4 life this turn. Very happy to still be alive, Griffin untaps and draws. He then pays 1 mana for a Glimpse the Cosmos from his graveyard, since Orvar is a giant, so he gets a card from the top 3 and puts the rest on the bottom of his library. He then pays 5 mana for Allround, God of the Cosmos, and heads into combat. Doing the math, he finds out that swinging everything is enough to take Landon out of the game. And Griffin is the winner. Hey everyone, Peter here to give you a quick note before we head into the post-game thoughts. 
You may have noticed that this game had a higher than average number of mistakes, especially towards the end of the game. While we were filming the game, we missed many lifelink triggers on Landon's side of the board, as well as the mistake earlier with the Iron Verdict, along with others you may have spotted. This game was really long compared to our typical game length on this channel. This game lasted about two and a half hours, and by the time Caleb and Peter were knocked out of the game, we were so tired and we were missing things left and right. We've reviewed the game as a whole, to see if we needed to redo this one, but we've decided that we should be accountable for missing everything and go with the results that the game gave us. We're still learning a lot about playing remotely and playing with more limited decks is teaching us a lot about paying close attention to the board at all times. We're going to take the state of the game as what we recorded it and we're going to try to stick with that in the future and just hold ourselves more accountable to that. Anyways, thank you for watching and now we'll continue to our post-game thoughts. Rip in peace, Landon. Rip in peace. Rip in peace. I think that four for Angel with Vigilance absolutely would have made some different decisions, uh, but at the end it seemed like I was able to to pull out on top. So we're thinking that it probably would have been me in the end, but that four for Angel with Vigilance definitely would have made a difference. So just make sure that you guys are watching. When you play a great solve Sternheim, remember that that Angel has flying and it also has Vigilance. <laughs> Also, it helps to use the proper token. I think I was just using like some random token to represent the card. So if I would have been using the right token, it would have had vigilance marked on it. I probably would have caught it earlier, but. But definitely well played, Len. I think uh, over the course of the game, you made a lot of decisions that affected the board. Board wiping, uh, that Eradicator Valkyrie, that beginning of the game, Turgrid Shadow that caused people to sacrifice their creatures. You just made a lot of impact on the board by kind of staying back a little bit. Yeah, honestly, I just felt like my deck was pretty bad and pretty unassuming. So I think people's sights were on everything else. I think if more people would have been putting more resources against me, I probably wouldn't have been able to last that long in the game. So I was honestly super pleased about how this game turned out. I was a little bit nervous that the decks would all feel like basically the same deck. And despite us having a lot of the same cards, I really felt like everybody's strategy was pretty laid out and pretty distinct from one another. Uh, Griffin was foretelling more cards than everybody else, although everybody else was foretelling cards. Peter had way more snow synergy, although everybody else was dealing with snow. And I was casting a lot of spells, even though everybody else was casting a lot of spells too. So, I don't know, I kind of feel like I was pleasantly surprised by how the gameplay went. And that's kind of what we were looking for when we uh, conceived this idea of only using standard cards that are found in a draft booster box so so my thoughts on this game are very similar to yours land and there was a fear for this game that the decks would all be very similar that they'd all play very similarly a lot of the cards were going to be the same but it did turn out that all the decks had a certain strategy that they gravitated towards and that strategy came out during the game so i was very happy to see all the decks doing what they wanted to do and it did make for an enjoying game that didn't feel like it was just playing from one set we're going to hand it over to Peter and Caleb to share their post-game thoughts, and then they'll throw it back to us when they're done. Hey guys, Peter here again. The game was a lot of fun for me, and I got a lot out there on the board. I just got too much attention at the beginning of the game and didn't have any flying support to go against everyone else's flying support. Towards the end, I had no card advantage either because I wiped it all away with blood on the snow. That pilfering hawk and that Varagoth would have helped me a lot later, and that gave my control of what my deck was doing away, and I ended up drawing duds for the rest of the game. So I'm definitely doing some recalculations for the next game, and the deck's going to be even stronger next time. Hey guys, Caleb again. I had a very good starting hand that helped me get access to all five colors very quickly, which is exactly what my deck needs to do. And I really wanted to play the Prismatic Bridge half of Asika much earlier in this game. However, I knew that the second I did, it was going to be destroyed by Peter's Binding of the Old Gods. So I think I waited a little too long to start getting value from that, but I really didn't want to play it and then do nothing for a turn, just have it destroyed. And I'm kind of worried that in our next game, I could get a hand that doesn't let me get on the board as quickly as this one did. But thankfully, the deck has a lot of foretell cards, as we saw in the game. And this game went really long, so I think I still have a chance, a good chance, to win with this deck in the next game. The biggest blow for me during this game was definitely getting my Doomscar countered by Griffin but it was a really good political play by him. Overall, it was a super fun game, and I am really looking forward to the next one. 
So now, Griffin, let's go over the play of the game and the MVP card of the game. Uh, what are your thoughts about those? This one is going to be really hard. There were so many decisions and plays that made a huge impact. Definitely has to be Peter's blood on the snow into the Dreadmarn. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to agree with that. I think, number one, it was going to be the blood on the snow into the Dreadmarn that Peter played, allowing him to wipe the board and also get his Jorn and eight zombies back and be able to cast Narfi the next turn. That was a massive play in the game that shifted the entire dynamic. I also think uh, Caleb's Battle of Frost and Fire made a huge impact on the game as well, because that seemed like the game was about to be closing out, and then it reset everybody back, which was also a, a huge impact. So I think one of those two are going to count as the play of the game. What about you, Landon? So I highly agree, and the play of the game was the Dreadmarn. Um, that really put so much power onto the board for Peter. Like, it, it allowed Peter to have... The resources to push through the board stall whereas nobody else really had that type of power unless they had flyers so Landon, what do you think is the mvp card of the game what do you think was the most important card in this gameplay episode oh man so for the mvp card of the game we're kind of cheating a little because we're lumping together groups of cards so we're gonna lump together the board wipes and the flyers those are really the two card types that really changed the dynamic of the game whoever had the board wipes and whoever had the flyers really was the strongest in this game yeah it seemed like at the end of the game the things that made the most difference were the cards that said destroy all creatures and the cards that said flying uh, <laughs> as you can see every single player died by not being able to block flyers so that just shows the potency of flying in in limited and and definitely when you have a smaller card pool to choose from let's do a a, a bunch of math right here and total up the wins so far for the season if my calculations are correct, Griffin, you are in the lead with one win. Yay! Cool. Glad, glad we got that. Glad we out. got that out of the way. That was a <laughs> yeah. that hurt my brain. <laughs> uh -huh. All right, guys, that is it for this gameplay episode, episode one of Duel of the Peaks season two. Episode two of Duel of the Peaks season two. We'll be featuring the same decks from Cal Time. However, we can switch out cards in the ninety nine if we want to so the next episode will be coming out shortly after this one and then the next episode will be featuring cards from time spiral so we're super excited for that no release date yet but it will be announced very soon sweet and with that that is the end of this episode thank you guys so much for watching make sure you leave a comment about what you thought was the most important play of the game the most important card of the game and which decks do you think represented their strategies the best we super appreciate you guys, invite you to go like this video, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already, and check out all of our other content, including, if you haven't already, watch season one of Duel of the Peaks, which was very fun, and we're very excited to be on season two. But with that, Len and I will bid you adieu, and see you for the next episode of Duel of the Peaks. See you guys. See ya. You know, honestly, when it wasn't my turn, I went and laid down in my bed, so... <laughs> 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 I'm I'm not kidding. That's awesome. <laughs>